And this is. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Tricia. Okay, I'm Naomi Nemso. This is a Bower Gallery panel discussion. Uh, the title is Five Artists Discuss Collage and Cutouts. And what we're finding during this very strange and um, difficult period that we're in, that it's important that we still find ways to gather. And so we're very glad that you're all here in our virtual space. I guess it does have one upside is we can have folks um, joining us from all around the country. So that's the good part. The panelists this evening in the order that we're gonna present are uh, first turn Pardee, then my then myself, then Mark Lewis, Stephanie Franks, and Monica Bernier, Trisha Vita, who is our gallery manager, and Hearn are the facilitators this evening, and we thank them for that. And um, all of us in this group are painters who incorporate cut paper or other forms of collage into our painting practice. We're going to be talking about how we came to our current practices and how our cut paper habit fits into our more general uh, practice as painters. We also have a collage show up on Artsy right now, so we'll, we hope you'll take a look at that if you haven't had a chance to see it. And the Artsy show includes nine Bowery Gallery members, uh, this panel plus several other talented painters. The format for the evening is that each artist will present and then we'll open the virtual floor for questions. And there are going to be two ways you can ask questions. If you'd like to um, use the chat function on Zoom, you can do that. But when you use the chat function, please address your question to Trisha Vita. Um, and there's a little pull down menu on chat if you're not familiar with that. So use the pull down menu, find Trisha, and address the question to her, and she's going to track them. Um, and, or you can do it the old fashioned way and raise your hand in real life. Um, okay, so let's start with Hearn, Hearn Pardee. Thank you very much. Um, Trisha has to start the images going there. Can okay, you Trisha, we're ready for the Share your screen and... Um... Great, okay, this is where I'm going to start, uh, which goes back to 1965 when my art study began with the Joseph Albers color class. Uh, and that class opened my eyes to painting as a visual medium, uh, considering the effect of one color on the neighboring color, rather than just a way of making pictures. Visually, I was especially intrigued by the so-called Betzelt effect, which is illustrated here, where the lighter and darker squares change the background color and open up layers in space. Um, looking at things this way inspired my interest in Cezanne and in uh, the Swiss artist Paul Klee, whose improvisation and interest in children's art has led to my later interest in parks, recreational sites, and schoolyards here in Davis. Next, Tricia. Uh, here's another one. Uh, a lot of times I like to use these sort of internal frames and compartments. Next. Uh, this is going on later at the New York Studio School where I studied in the 70s, and I developed an expanded approach to collage under the abstract expressionist painter George McNeil who taught us Hans Hoffman's process of abstracting perceptual space, uh, encouraging free improvisation from the model in the studio. Uh, we worked in paint and colored paper, uh, culminating with the emergence of figures from the expressive field. Uh, at the same time, I was also working outdoors, pursuing my interest in Cezanne. Next. Uh, in 1980, I moved to Maine following my partner's teaching job at Colby College. And here I was trying to combine uh, the collages with my uh, Cezanne-like outdoor paintings. Uh, this is an image of Waterville, Maine, looking at the Kennebec River. I drew images from uh, paintings I made outdoors onto small wood panels. This one's only about 10 inches, and filled them in with, past, with pasted colored papers that I made up in the studio. I wanted my colors to be more like Matisse, and I made up colors I wanted to see rather than trying to imitate the subdued browns and grays of everyday scenes. The color constructions with simple planes reminded me of early Renaissance paintings. 
While living in Maine, I was inspired by Marsden Hartley and through him uh, by Alfred Stieglitz's idea of the local, of how he wanted American artists to apply European modernism to uh, scenes here in the United States. Next. Uh, this one was made later in New York, late 80s, which uh, I conceived that uh, in New York, uh, more gray related to Mondrian's overall space with his plus minus compositions like pier and ocean, which aren't completely abstract. I keep the drawing in here because I want to focus on details to keep grounded in that specific local place that Stieglitz uh, mentioned, in this case, a view towards Grant's tomb. Uh, and uh, Stieglitz felt that grounding in the local ensured that you were connected to subconscious uh, uh, experiences, to memories and things that uh, gave life to the image. Next. Uh, here in Maine, uh, I'm working uh, with an image I did outdoors uh, again, using drawing to ground it in the literal uh, place, of which is a mountain near Rome, Maine. Um, I overlaid it with paint and collage. That went on uh, for several years, actually, before I uh, considered this one finished. Next. Uh, in 2000, we moved to California, where I am now. And uh, that, of course, uh, required a very uh, big adjustment to a new local landscape of suburban subdivisions. And um, perhaps in response to that, I went back to the Betzeld effect, which I felt uh, was one of my great successes from my undergraduate painting years. And uh, I thought I'd try it again, and this time on a larger scale. This is about 24 by 18 inches, um, kind of combining uh, Albers more on a scale of Hans Hoffmann. Uh, this Betzeld effect has gone on to uh, invade my perceptually based work. Next. Uh, this one uh, comes from a series in uh, 2010. Um, or no, this one actually, we skipped that one, sorry. Uh, this one, can you go back, Tricia, or did we just not have that one? No, okay, all right, we left that one out, that's all right. Um, this one uh, is uh, going back to Paul Clay and his involvement with children's art. Uh, I was thinking of that because this is the elementary school where my son attended class in Davis. And um, I was inspired again by Paul Clay with his improvisational use of the grid, <clears throat> finding uh, a kind of structured security with free improvisation. And I'm beginning here to uh, combine the, uh, the Betzeld effect with uh, layering it on the observed landscape, where the uh, divisions created by the Betzeld effect function kind of like a surgical suture, uh, opening up the uh, conventional uh, unified view we have of a, of a landscape picture. Next, here's another one. Uh, this is a, a park. I found public spaces seem to facilitate this kind of way of combining the, uh, the formal play of the Betzeld effect with the, uh, with the literal uh, picture of a place. Uh, somehow a public space seemed to foster that kind of idea. And um, also like parks and recreation, here you can see there's a baseball field and um, there's a circular track here where I go to run. And so um, it's a personal place. And I began thinking as I experienced the place more about the process of perception, about what we really see and uh, how we encounter things through the shifts in our attention. Next. That's good. Um, this one is very big. It's about uh, six feet by nine feet. And it's a uh, multi-panel piece that I made when I was trying to explore just my daily experience of the neighborhood here uh, in Davis. And I um, wanted to think about the way we, we make personal connections to familiar places and seemingly insignificant details become personal to us because we know them so well. And I took a cinematic approach to this, going out and painting houses and yards every day and then uh, putting them up on the studio wall so I could edit them rearranging the panels and adding colored paper, uh, kind of like the Hans Hoffman process to create an overall image. Uh, I consider it kind of like psychogeography, uh, recapitulating the way that we become, uh, we make ourselves at home in unfamiliar places. Next. Uh, this one kind of compresses things further. This is about four feet by three feet and I've put like eight different uh, framed images kind of in together and integrated them all uh, here, and this is again based on that park uh, where I go to run, 
with its benches and baseball field. I put in some uh, butterflies and moths from a collection I made as a child and I still keep in the studio. Um, I'm inspired by uh, sort of undefined spaces, spaces I guess like parks where they're open to uh, our use, uh, free use and to memory and reflection. Uh, and it reminds me of the field where I used to collect insects when I was a, when I was a kid. Um, these are harder and harder to find these days where our spaces and times are more and more subject to uh, some kind of structure. Um, circles and circuits became important to me uh, as I worked on these, uh, where I began to think more about the 360 degree field of vision, which is what we really experience when we're out in the landscape. Um, we, we don't see in terms of that single eye point of the camera. Uh, we're really experiencing the entire uh, space. Uh, one section of this park in particular contains a, a circle of stones that's oriented according to the zodiac and also provides bike jumps for kids. So I'm inspired by that sort of a uh, content as a, as a free space. Next. Oh, this is one my, I was going to talk about earlier, but let's just skip on. I uh, don't know how that got where it is, but next one. Yeah, this is when um, about three years ago, I started using a video camera, thinking about this idea of getting the full 360 degree view. I um, made a video as I walked around this circuit in the park and then uh, made drawings uh, from the video as it played. Um, again, using the drawing to kind of note down specific details, but uh, opening up my focus since I couldn't uh, get everything as it was going by. Um, I like the way that the video artist Peter Campus talks about video as durational perception. He makes very long videos of one thing without changing the camera very much. And so I'm thinking in terms of that uh, process. Um, I'm working as I work, the, my attention jumps from one focal area to another, uh, which is pretty much the way we operate in everyday life, where we're keeping our eyes moving all the time. And I think about what happens in between uh, those shifts in attention. Um, while I was using the Betzeld effect to create a kind of suture in the field, now um, I'm dealing with actual gaps where our attention uh, shifts from one thing to another. And I use the color grid to suggest the way of filling in those intervening spaces, uh, incorporating the, um, whatever is unnoticed and unconscious in the spaces around us. Uh, and the um, color grid also provides a vertical horizontal framework, uh, which is what we rely on to know where we are and to orient ourselves. It's based on our sense of gravity and our own body in the space. Um, so I'm trying to give a, a sense of our total experience in the field, I guess. Next. Uh, this is a very recent uh, four part thing. These are um, you know, each about three by four feet, these four panels. And um, I combined elements from the videos again, uh, along with uh, sections of colored paper that I generate as I'm making up colors. I'm interested uh, in experimental film and I'm thinking about kind of generating a sense of narrative through the collage. It's not an explicit narrative, but that gets at an overall feeling. Uh, so these frames kind of zoom in and out. You can see there's that stone circle in the upper left there, which I was talking about and it appears in an enlarged form down in the lower right where it's kind of like zooming in. So um, that circle of stones has been kind of a focus point for me just because it links this suburban subdivision to the universe, you know, the orientation of the sun and the um, changes of the seasons. So um, in summary, I would just say that, uh, you know, collage has always dealt with the fragmentation of modern life and uh, forcing us to deal with uh, glimpses and try and generate some vision of unity. Um, and uh, to me, it also connects, it suggests connections between abstraction and lived experience. So uh, that's what I'm looking at in these with uh, always kind of an open-ended process of construction. Um, and I should say just uh, in conclusion that I still love Cezanne and uh, I'm working in paint also, <laughs> trying to get to the weighty uh, enduring forms that Cezanne uh, worked with. So uh, that also remains an unresolved process. Okay, I'll let uh, pass it on to Naomi now. Okay, so she can thank you, her. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Hi. Um, okay, I'm starting 
with a collage called White Car at Pathmark, which is from uh, a show I had in 2012. And uh, my basic methodology for uh, my collages is that I paint large sheets of paper ahead of time with acrylic paint. And sometimes I know what the palette is going to be that I'm going to work with. And sometimes I'm just making colors of paper and collecting them and, and they get used um, sometimes and sometimes not. Um, so this is a composition that was based in a painting that I did um, from observation. And uh, can we have the next slide, please? Okay, so this is a spot, uh, Pathmark uh, supermarket with a parking lot. Uh, the highway you see overhead is the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. And I've done many paintings and drawings in this location over many years. If we can go back to the first one. Uh, Trisha, can we go back one? Yeah. So um, from that painting and from other uh, paintings done in that spot, I did a series of collages, and this is the third of that series. These, this is 40 inches by 30 inches. And in that series, they got progressively simpler and um, I guess more abstract. Uh, and what I'm doing, or at least what I hope I'm doing, is I'm able, uh, I'm, I'm, well, what I hope I'm doing is distilling the experience of working from observation. What I like very much about coming back to the studio and making collages based in the paintings is that I'm much freer to think about composition because I don't have all the complexity and distraction that one has um, when working in plein air. Um, so, uh, yeah, so in the studio, I can think about composition in a whole different way. I also studied with George McNeil and date my collage practice back to his drawing class in the 1970s. And one of the things uh, McNeil insisted upon was that the collage, uh, that the uh, composition include the four edges or however many edges of the canvas or the paper, that you couldn't have a object sitting in the middle. The, the, the composition includes the edges, it has to extend to the edges, and he also talked a lot about activating the whole surface, which stayed with me. Next slide, please. Actually, two slides forward. Yeah, okay. I've used um, this kind of collage methodology for studies of um, some of the masters. So one of my favorite all, of all time paintings is the Bruegel Harvesters at the Met which I started drawing from as a student and have continued to draw from. Uh, I did a series of collages from it a few years ago. Um, this is one of them. And um, as you know, um, the Bruegel is very rich with enormous detail and everything fits into its own location and it extends very far back into space. What I'm doing here is just trying to see what, how, what are the basic shapes? What are the basic movements? How does it fit together? It feels something like a jigsaw puzzle to me. And I did a series of studies here. Um, it's a, re, a simplified palette. I use simplified palettes in the collages, usually about six colors. Um, and here the palette is fairly close to Bruegel's palette. In some of the other studies, I depart from, the, from that palette. Um, and the way I think about using the color in these is I want the eye to travel. Um, so let's say uh, we're starting with the white shape at the top. I want the eye to travel from white to white to white around the canvas and ditto for the dark browns and each of the other colors so that there's a web of um, paths that the eye is taking. Next, please. Okay, uh, now I'm gonna show you some work from a series I did in, um, uh, for my 2015 show. I often draw on the subway. I have, like many uh, other artists, I have books and books of subway drawings, and this is one of them from 2014 that became a basis for some collages and some other uh, work that I did. Um, 
and this is just small on a sketchbook. Next, please. Here, I've taken that same drawing. The figure, uh, the woman holding the baby, is taken from the figure in the drawing that was a woman sitting with a cup of coffee, but now um, it's kind of evolved. The three figures on the right side in white, um, I had been drawing from some men uh, who were wearing turbans and other Middle Eastern garb in a completely different drawing. So sometimes I take multiple drawings and assemble them. And um, this was done at a, approaching Christmas time. And as it was evolving, um, I decided that the woman was going to be the Madonna. And, and so this became Holy Family on the A train. And um, uh, I did a series then, you know, emanating from this. Here I'm using collage in part to make corrections to the earlier drawing or to make changes to the earlier drawing or for points of emphasis. Next, please. This is a large collage. Well, for me, large, it's 36 by 48. And based in the previous color study that we saw. And here again, I'm distilling and simplifying the shapes, staying to um, uh, a limited palette. And again, composing by uh, having the eye travel from, say, from one turquoise to the other to a path of the other turquoises and the same for the other colors. And um, while the subway car has become very simplified and very and somewhat abstracted, I did want to hold on to the feeling of the subway car. And so I was striving to both distill and hold on to that experience. Uh, next, please. Okay, um, this is one of a series that I did based on another one of my favorite paintings in New York, the Bellini um, at the Morgan. And uh, here I'm using, so again, like Bruegel, the Bellini is full of all kinds of vignettes, all kinds of detail. Here I'm using large shapes just to try to figure out how this painting is put together. And this is actually an early stage of this particular uh, version. So I've started with large color shapes and then I've gone into it to draw with, um, I think I was using pastels and uh, various things. Um, and uh, trying to first get the big shapes and then see what else can I capture, but What's most important to me is to not lose the overall structure, to not let any of the fascinating small things that are happening become distractions for the large composition. Next, please. <coughs> uh, from the same series, another uh, version, I did a bunch of these. Um, so yeah, pretty much what I said before. Um, trying here as well to create some equivalent to the light in the Bellini. The light in the Bellini is amazing. And um, what I understand from listening to lectures about it is that the light uh, symbolizes uh, St. Francis being enlightened by God. Um, be that as it may, uh, for me, I, I just love the light as a painter. And I am not copying uh, the color in a literal way, but looking for some, some equivalence to give that feeling. Uh, next, please. Okay, so now we're in 2020 and we're in this very strange time when we can't go outside and we can't go to the museum and we can't go to galleries and uh, we're being asked to please stay home and for me, it's, a, it's been a very scary time. Um, how this series started, and I call this series Quarantine Collages. This started uh, one day when, in early spring when I was on a rather long Zoom call. And I will tell you, I got a little bored with the Zoom call. And I have lots of scraps of colored paper from all my collage work. And I started just picking up little bits of colored paper and 
pushing them around on a page in a, on a drawing pad. And that became more interesting than the Zoom call. Um, so I glued down the pieces and then I picked up a heavy pencil and started making drawing marks with no particular figurative goal. Um, just, again, I'm trying to activate the whole surface. I'm trying to compose to the edges. And I'm letting the shapes and the marks um, just come from wherever they're coming from. And I can't tell you exactly where that is. The large um, red, red brown shape on the left suggested the ancient Pueblos in New Mexico to me. So I gave it the title Quarantine Collage with Pueblo. Next, please. Uh, another one from the Quarantine Collage series. In this one, um, I gave myself the assignment to make a collage only using various greens. I find green a terribly difficult color to work with. And when I'm outside doing landscape, well, since I'm mostly in the city, that doesn't, that's not a huge problem. But in any rural environment or wherever there's more foliage, I have the devil's own time with the green. So I decided I should make a collage just using greens. Um, although after a while I cheated and put some yellow and red in it. And that kind of takes us up to the present. I will say that people have said to me that these collages um, are whimsical. Um, people have said that they're even joyous. And that's a bit of a mystery. Uh, that is not how I'm feeling. I'm mostly feeling terrified. But um, this series of collages uh, has a mind of its own and they have become whimsical um, through no intent of mine. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, my presentation. And next we have someone who pushes collage to an extreme that I would not have known was possible, and that is Mark Lewis. Thank you, Naomi. I've uh, pulled together 12 images that span the last 37 years of collaging, and I'm starting with a painting here. Initially, I worked with the still life, and for many years, I thought of myself as a still life painter. In this first slide, I became preoccupied with constructing the painting with a pigmented mark, looking for content and light in paint. I tried painting visual size to challenge earlier approaches to my perceptual painting. So I created the format within the format while I was working on the painting frame within a frame. At the time, I was thinking about several painters. Uh, Augustin was one of the painters. I loved the paint construction of the early abstract paintings from the mid 50s. And of course, I'm probably even more so interested in his late work at this time. Uh, so this painting's from 1983. It's about 11 by nine inches and the central image is probably five and a half by four and a half inches. It's oil and canvas. Other painters I was looking at, Giacometti, Ruth Miller, Chardin, and maybe Nicholas de Chal. Uh, next slide, please. Subsequently, I started uh, developing the form of the painting with the format. Collage, working with paper, gave me the flexibility to approach the painting this way. So, so collage became a necessity for the development of painting rather than as a technique to explore. But I always loved collage artists, artists like Kurt Switters, for example. And for all these paintings, I created a color palette to start and to develop each collage. I simply like drawing and painting uh, with paper. Next slide. This is a little bit fuzzy, uh, but I decided to take the collage process outside in the landscape and in the mid 90s. Initially, I didn't think it was possible or practical to collage outdoors, but there is always a way. I feel the collage process gave me access to light in the work, providing unique opportunities, experimenting with color combinations in a spontaneous way and by creating rhythms as well. The streets the street scenes, places where we converge, started to replace my tabletop stage sets. Okay, next slide. This is another landscape from that time. This is 1998 and it's about 40, 54 by uh, 46 inch, inches. Uh, I, I, I guess the extreme scale change uh, 
in the landscape became interesting to me. And that was something relatively new. Um, and earlier in say the late eighties, I was attracted to closed spaces, spaces, spaces more like rooms in the landscape. Next slide. Most of my works derive from, from, from uh, excuse me, from perception. Though I do make works that are inspired indir indirectly by perception, starting with the blank canvas, for example, and for letting the collage evolve. evolve. Here's a um, tree collage. And in the next slide, uh, it's a night scene. And this is probably about nine by six inches. Next slide. This is a group of fairly recent market collages. They started with a series of drawings from live. I decided to develop a second group collaging from video. I enjoyed working from the moving video in time. I stood in the uh, same place to draw and to make the video. It was more like perception in a way, choosing from the uh, moving activity in front of me on the screen. I enjoyed watching and making choices from this subject as it changed. Next slide. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is the largest piece in the group. It's about 114 by 152 inches. It's titled Scene Street Fiction. It's related to experiences working on the streets over the past years. It's more invented though than remembered. Um, it's made with found objects, clothing, and acrylic paint. Um, I like the idea of collaging, drawing with it, real objects. They provide a unique physical present and uh, unique relationships. I more or less have a palette of clothing and found objects too. Next slide. Uh, I've been making graphite collages since 2009. Uh, the graphite drawings I was working on at the time simply weren't tactile enough. The recent collages are more, uh, are more open, employing the breadth and depth of space. Uh, this one's from 2011. It's 60 by 87 inches. And I generally make these graphite collages in the summer. I think I worked on this one over a summer and a half. The Tulsa landscape's unique, for example. I love the extreme scale changes on Peoria Avenue. It's near the Arkansas River. It's very flat there. I think that part of town would be considered on a floodplain. I try to look at perspective, the perspective aspect of the location as an X, those forces of triangles that are created, rather than only seeing perspective uh, as converging lines. I saw a show of Bre uh, Bruegel, I saw a Bruegel show at the Metropolitan Museum a few years ago. I love the way he included all the human activity in the landscape, but a drawing tile of prudence, including a butcher shop, Dr. Surgeon, everyone active with daily life. Each section of the drawing is full and rich. And I love the way we moved up in the landscape in that particular drawing, it's quite beautiful. Uh, light in material and the idea of time in a work is very important to me. Proportion and a quality of measurement can relate to time. It's not just time spent working, accumulating information, but time spent looking and responding as in dialogue with the work. I like to think of each section of the collage as a chapter. I want to bring those chapters together to make a book. There's no rush for closure. I want, to work, I want the work to unfold for the viewer, viewer in time, and I want to share with the viewer my experiences of being on the street. Uh, next slide, please. I went ahead and included this. It's just a, a, a photo of my setup. A lot of people uh, are kind of surprised that I'll do some of the collages outside. And uh, just want to give you, you know, a glimpse of that setup anyway. So here I've got a gallon of glue, uh, a box with small pieces of prepped paper in a grayscale, a folder with larger sheets of paper, and also a bucket of tools, that sort of thing. So I just drive down to a setup every morning, uh, unload the truck and work usually for three to four hours, then load up again and go back the next day. And like I said, these collages you'll I usually work over the summer. Next slide. Uh, this is the detail of the work from this summer. I decided to work on TU's campus instead of working on the city streets. I included the slides because I wanted to get more of a, maybe a tactile nature of the physicality of the paper. Next slide. 
This is a uh, this is a the most recent work from this summer. It's in a finished state. Uh, I may continue to work on it next summer. We'll see. To close, I just want to say that I, I like the unpredictable nature of collage. Collage provides unique opportunities in working with shape, color, light, and surface. Collage gives me an opportunity to satisfy a certain visual hunger. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark. That was wonderful. Um, our next presenter is going to be Stephanie Franks. And um, I'm take it away, Stephanie. Thanks, Naomi. <clears throat> so like Herna Naomi, I began doing collage in George McNeil's class. Actually, I'm not sure if that's where Hern uh, started doing collage, but I know that we were all influenced by being in George McNeil's class at the New York Studio School. I was there in the late 70s. Uh, he would sometimes tell us to let accidents play a role, as in letting a piece of paper drop onto a collage surface. And where it landed, it could stay. It was a way to free us up before painting. I have kept collage going as an integral part of my studio practice ever since. As a grad student in Louis Finkelstein's wonderful Bonnard seminar at Queens College in the mid 80s, I did this collage intended to evoke the textured surfaces, optical mixtures, and to quote from Louis, appetitious color of Bonnard. This collage used papers painted with varying combinations of colored dots. If there is one thing that has always driven my painting and collage, it is color for color's sake. While my collages cover a broad range, it is one ingredient that is consistently meaningful to me. Color has generally been the thing in my work that comes most naturally and that I have a deep need to explore. Next. During my years teaching at Pratt Institute, my favorite course was called Light Color and Design. As I never had color theory as a student, I would often do the assignments on my own, many utilizing collage and many springing from Joseph Albers' book, Interaction of Color, in order to teach myself how to teach my students but also because it was great fun to do the assignments. While not coming directly out of Albers, one assignment was to have my students do color average grids in which they would attempt to record the average colors of gridded units of a reproduction or sometimes of something observed. This painted collage is a freed up version of one I did from Cezanne. Next. This is a tighter grid structure from a Cezanne landscape using magazine papers. In doing grids, I love the orderly and meditative process, the freedom to play within a rigorous structure, the freedom not to have to worry about composition and the resulting unexpected color. While enjoying the exploration of grids, I realized it was not in my true nature to limit myself to one avenue of expression. Next. <clears throat> I have a problem with clutter for real in my life and also at times in my art. Sometimes I just need to sweep away all the bits and pieces of activity with large strokes of a color or white and or erase them as I do a lot of my drawings or just use a big sweep of yellow as I did in this collage with the yellow wash. Next, as a byproduct of my education of, at the New York Studio School and my studies with Nick Caroni, synthetic cubism has been and continues to be a vital influence in my work, often reflected in overlapping planar structures and rhythmic elements. Next. <clears throat> After back surgery in early 2015, I resorted to doing collage as a stand-in for painting. My back was happier with a relatively weightless medium of collage as compared to works on canvas. 
While I like to spread out my numerous piles of variously colored shapes onto as many work tables as possible, I love how so many of these small works can fit neatly into a shoebox, as opposed to the amount of space needed to store years worth of paintings on canvas. Next. This one utilizes color aid paper, which I have painted into. I adore the rich, almost visually velvety, matte surfaces of color aid paper. My collages are often built of layers of paper. I like the bumpy, piled on surfaces, which become a kind of record of the process, like pentimenti in a drawing or painting. I may get to an almost finished place with the collage, then get, a, get upset because I can't figure out how to resolve it. Then I cut it up into a few strips perhaps and scramble them. It can be a never ending process. If I can't resolve it, I may put it away and then unbury it months or even years later. And then if I'm lucky, find the clarity to bring it to completion. Next. This one from 2018 to 19 is, among others I've done, riffing off a Juan Gris Cubist drawing. I saw in reproduction years ago, in which fragments of a still life were set off rhythmically against repeating rows of verticals. Here the vertical strips offer an anchor, a structure, a regularity against which I can be intuitive, improvisatory, and playful. The repetition and fractures in color and pattern reflect the jazz music I sometimes listen to in my studio. Next. Often my collages are quite flat, while composition, the primacy of the entire picture plane, the relationship of the parts to each other and to the whole are always important to me. I don't often think about spatiality in my collages in a way that I do, especially in my black and white drawings. My paintings can be somewhere in between on this issue. Color can have a flattening effect in my work. Next. <clears throat> These are from 2019 when I did a series of works in blue. Next. Blue can feel like a healing color to me. Next. This is also from 2019. Some of my work gets minimally abstract, like in this piece, which calls attention to the edges. To, to some extent, I attribute my love of cubism and my sometimes leaning into simplified abstraction to the favorite house I lived in as a child, a modernist Los Angeles house, replete with planar geometries. While my palette has changed and expanded as I age to include dull as well as bright colors, along with more combinations of similar in value and or hue colors, I attribute my early love of saturated, boldly contrasting colors to the warm light of my childhood home of Southern California. Next. This collage was a stroke of luck from 2015. Often I make collages out of the remnants of the cutting out process. In this case, the black, what I call teapot shape, was just that. I put it against the emerald green background and it was done, almost. I put that against a large solid black sheet of paper and then I have one of my to this day favorite collages. The animated object-like shape of the black teapot aligns with animated imagery in my black and white drawings, but such anthropomorphism does not occur as often in my collages. Next. This one from 2019 does feature a kind of animated character an influence gleaned from my study of Persian miniatures among other genre of art. Also, I push to get color in this one that is not beautiful in a conventional sense, maybe almost bad, but surprising and to me exciting. Next. This summer for the first time, I saw online mesmerizing images from the Villa of Mysteries in Pompeii. I was struck by the marvelous reds and deep burgundies played off against greens, violets, golden ochres, etc. This is my collage homage to these wall friezes, which I hope to get to someday when we can all travel again. Next. 
Oops, sorry, no next. That's oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm not finished though. For much of my painting career, my paintings would start from observation and get distilled and abstracted along the way. The collages generally not based on observation are abstract from the get-go with any reference to recognizable imagery being generally unplanned. When I began to seriously paint again about one year ago after my back surgery, some of the paintings sprang from observation as my drawings tend to do and progressed towards abstraction. New to my process, however, others began abstractly and stayed that way, some directly based on my collages. In both mediums, color is a guiding force and in both mediums, I go where the work leads me. Thank you. Thank you, Steffi. Mm -hmm. um, that was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And next, um, I'm delighted to present Monica Bernier. Monica? I muted myself. myself. Sorry. Here you are. Uh, my practice of collage and cutout is reciprocal with my painting. It informs my painting and the paint, painting likewise affects what happens in the collages. For me, it's also a more improvisational practice and so it can free me up at times. I would say that the body of work so far fits into approximately three categories. Collage that's sourced from magazine and newspaper imagery cutouts that explore pure color, shape, and geometry, and cutouts that create an invented, though abstracted, space. In the late 70s and 80s, when I began painting, primarily observational work from the figure, landscape, and still life, collage provided a way for me to explore abstraction, heightened color, and the psychological aspect of visual experience. It provided a kind of release or ex escape from the observed world. By the 2000s, the collages evolved during work on a series of paintings of biomorphic uh, sculptural forms and various images of Mayan glyphs and menhirs. That was followed by a series of invented landscapes composed of somewhat anthropomorphic rock and plant forms, occasionally pouring sand into the paint. I worked uh, in the collage with uh, both black and white cutouts and explored color vibrations using colored shapes laid over divisions of three, four, five colored rectangles underneath. This led to more complex collage in which shapes were interwoven. This image titled Generosity as a Disposition of the Dwellers of Paradise, done in 2008, uses gouache painted paper. It's 26 inches by 40 inches. This medium that I most often use in, this is the medium that I most often use in collage and prefer to call these cutouts. I have been interested in the arch as an element in architecture and painting, both for its idea of strength and support, as well as a pathway through to another space. I started using pattern elements in some of these cutouts cutouts as in this one. The two elements in this collage are the red figure on the left and the orange figure on the right. The figure on the left is derived from ancient Arabic calligraphy on a ceramic bowl. The figure on the right came from a moche ceramic vessel depicting the assault of bean warriors that I'd seen at the Art Institute of Chicago. In this case, I like the idea of a warrior in the shape of a bean somewhat humorous, but not intended to be by the moche. Then I put those dark black shapes on top, which seemed ominous, but also playful to me. Next image. In 2016 and 2017, I had a couple of productive years experimenting with various modes of collage and cutout. Following, these are uh, several small studies, about six by eight inches each, using colors cut from magazines. This is something I do frequently as practice, playing with the shape and color. Whether bright or subdued, I like working within a large range of color, from quiet neutrals to screaming bright hues. Next image. 
Always interested in Schwitter's, I did a few studies and variations from his collage titled Merz 134. In this case, I worked with paper cut from magazines as well. I focused on keeping the color tones, shapes, and lines within the geometry balanced and pleasing. Another example uh, from this study can be seen in the next image. Next image, please. In some like this one, I worked with washes of color on the base. Although less permanent, I like using pieces of magazine or newspaper imagery at times because it allows me to insert gradations and suggest form and space. This vein of thought was pursued in many, many more collages. Next image. As a separate investigation that year, I did a series of collages using fabric, prim primarily with transparent silks. Next image. I've always loved the synthetic cubist paintings of Picasso. Whereas my cutouts mostly do not allude to the subject, to subject matter as his does uh, most often, there are some that might suggest a particular space such as this one done in 2014. I see the center blue as sky and the white curvilinear shapes as clouds or smoke. Next image. In 2017, I worked on a series of cutouts that I think allude to the jumble of buildings that I see outside my New York apartment. These are four examples of the. Next image. And then more color investigations. These are cutouts using gouache painted papers. I was experimenting for a time with using Lumi colors, which are fluorescent colors to really pump up the, the, uh, the, the heightened color. Next image. In 2017, my husband and I took a three month cross country camping trip with the goal of visiting the national parks. What came out of that trip was a series of paintings and cutouts that were, that were very much based on the imagery of the Western landscape. Something that harked back to my, my invented uh, rock formations and, and um, plants. The cutout on top was based on a large painting of building sized sandstone structures in a Arches National Park. In that time I, period, I also did many paintings of swimming pools and the pool cut out below was one of the early explorations. For me, this series of cutouts and paintings had more to do with the feeling of the space rather than the copied representation of the place. However, this way of working from observed space at all is uh, quite atypical of my collage practice. Next image. Landscape has come back in some form or other in my most recent work lately. These cutouts have all been worked over painted gradated grounds overlaid with cut papers painted with both solid and painterly gradations of color, also gouache. Lately, I've been exploring the darker range of color and light in these cutouts. And this may relate to my explorations into nighttime landscapes and my drawing and paintings. I would say that these cutouts suggest a landscape that is imagined rather than real. Although I don't start out to depict a specific landscape, they evolve as I improvise while cutting out the painted papers. Next image. Here the underpainting started with a gradation of the blackest black that I could make to a middle gray at the bottom. I did proceed with this cutout as an idea of night. The shapes and forms cut from paper or found from remnants of cuttings were applied improvisationally. There is a cloud at the top and the arch within the middle form. Some have observed uh, that the uh, rolled form at the bottom uh, appears to be 
uh, a wave or some sort of water. Next image. The process was the same here, although it started with the dark black on top at the very end. I felt that the gray area worked better on top and the yellow felt like a sudden illumination that needed to be above the other forms and shapes. Then also that top gray area, I had to apply it since I thought that the underpainting was too light. And by using a paper that had some mottled color, it activated the space and added some atmosphere I thought. The shape and the placement that I finally settle on in my cutouts and collage mostly arrive after many attempts at cutting and positioning. Finally, you can see over time I have worked in different modes and sometimes have done so concurrently. I don't feel constrained to work in one manner, particularly since for me collage is a means of exploration. It's a practice in all senses of the word. Thank you. And I guess now Tricia can take over. Okay, so now thank you uh, to the presenters. Um, we're now gonna have a question and answer time. And Tricia is going to pose some questions that people have been asking, I think. Tricia? Okay, I'm looking at the questions. Let's see. Yeah. Um, there seems to be a lot of comments um, thanking for their, let's see, uh, Greer Torrance said, Hearn, amazing pushing of color identities through gathered shapes. Love the, love the subway ones, my, Naomi. Um, Are you saying any questions? Um, let's see. Hmm. If not, we can. Uh, let me. Uh, yeah. Why don't you ask uh, if anyone has any questions just to ask while I scroll through? Because I could not, I cannot see the chat when I am sharing my screen. Sure. So sure. I'm looking at sure. them for the first time. Sure. Would anyone? Yes, Barbara. We don't hear you, Barbara. You have to unmute. Are you muted again? Am I muted? You're good now. Thank you. Um, I was very, um, this isn't exactly a question, but it's a provocation for a comment from uh, either Hearn or Mark, actually, uh, because you both very much engage in um, the notion of time, uh, either with the um, assistance of a video or the notion of multiple things going on at once. And I think that's very interesting because uh, I've always had this argument with musicians that they play in time, but really one can only hear one note or one phrase at a time. But when we look at art, we're seeing the multiples all the time and activating that sense of, you know, how much we are engaged in looking at time while we make things. Um, does that interest you, um, Hearn? Hearn, you have to unmute. Um, yeah, definitely. I'm very interested in that, just that idea of simultaneity and mm -hmm. the, uh, the way that things are brought together. And I think, uh, yeah, there's a kind of power that video confers when you're able to pull together experiences over time because, um, uh, it's, it's kind of reciprocal in a way. I think our ex experience is, is always developed through time. And uh, I think painting has a great uh, opportunity to kind of uh, reflect that because we can look at a painting for a long time and you can put a lot of things into the painting that, um, you know, we can appropriate slowly. Right. Yeah. No. It's something artists don't, visual, you know, visual artists don't always talk about, but it seems particularly cogent in your work. And I also felt it in Mark's, um, you know, multiple activities going on in, in those collages, uh, you know, with the jamming of stuff going on all the time. And it, that's very interesting. No, I, I, yeah. I agree. I'm just going to say I love the quality of time in a work and I love to be able to sit with it and just explore 
I think that was part of my experience with the, the Bruegel drawing I'd mentioned that I'd seen how it was so full and rich. And uh, though in some, some of my pieces, it is sort of employing some of those uh, observations of human activity, but sometimes just section of the painting, like the little, and a little abstract section of a painting, uh, just love to get lost in sections and then uh, hopefully bringing all those sections together at the same time. Thank you. Uh, it was a terrific uh, presentation from everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks, Barbara. Um, somebody else, any other questions? If I don't see you, speak up. Uh, Tricia, do we have any, were there any actual questions in the chat or not so much? Uh, let's see, there was a question asking, um, uh, watching, watching on video screens and can't see the works in person, <clears throat> I can't always determine if I'm looking at a drawing, painting, or a true cutout or collage. A quick explanation of the differences might help many viewers. Thanks much, Andrew Gurian. Um, I'll start. Uh, could you, I'm sorry. So Andrew is asking, how can he tell when he's looking um, on screen, whether he's looking at a collage? Whether he's looking at, I can't always determine if I'm looking at a drawing, painting, or a true cutout, or a collage. I would say that's one of the things that we lose when we look at images online. Um, so other people may feel differently, but I would say that looking online, I don't know either uh, much of the time unless it's identified. When we look at works in actuality, we have a much better sense of the material um, and how the material is applied to the surface. And, um, yeah, you don't get that online in my I would say that experience. I would say that all of the things that I showed were all uh, cutouts or collages, just to clarify. Yeah, now to differentiate between um, collage and cutout, this is something we discussed among our group. Um, Monica likes to use the phrase cutout. Others of us use collage. Monica was pointing out the chief things of collage is incorporating multiple materials other than um, cut paper. Am I representing you correctly? Yes, yes. yes. Cut paper, I think of as uh, prepared, uh, you know, with um, painted papers. Uh, that the artist. That the artist makes and, and uh, collage, I think of as more uh, materials that are found and incorporated into an image. That's just my, I, that's my understanding of, of, of the difference, especially uh, if you think of the cutouts of Matisse, they're essentially primarily his, uh, his uh, original uh, color painted papers that uh, he arranged in, in various ways. So that's well, how I- In that English. context, I would ask Monica and uh, I would ask Steffi, as well, when you use magazine paper, is does that feel different in that regard, using magazine paper that's been found? That for me is collage. Okay, so that's um, where for, okay. You know, I haven't thought that much about the um, difference between collage and cutout, except when I hear the phrase cutout, I think of Matisse. Um, so I. But uh, yeah, it does. It feels different when I use magazine papers because, um, you know, I generally I, I do use prepared papers a lot, but they're colorate papers, so those feel very different than magazine papers. And then there are papers that I paint myself ahead of time and use those, and then there and then I paint on top of paper. Magazine papers give me a kind of palette that is just, it's kind of extraordinary and I, and I do love using magazine papers. I don't do it very often because I, I have a feeling it's probably not archival and I don't know how long it will take to before it starts to self-destruct. 
I, I don't know if I'm answering you very yeah. well, Naomi. I had a thought. I was just thinking of um, Matisse's cutouts. I think they're, they're sort of set up in opposition to Picasso's collage, where Picasso is actually trying to trick you in many cases. He'll make fake wallpaper, or then he'll make drawings that look like wallpaper. And um, it, it really is, uh, to answer the question, kind of deliberately confusing the viewer as to what's real and what's not. Picasso enjoys that sort of thing, I think, where where Matisse was interested in just the purely formal development of colored shapes. Well, that's one point of view, but then there is Schwitters who also took pieces of graphic art from various places and incorporated that into a, an image that was uh, uh, purely abstract, except for the, ref the, the literary references within them. So I tend to think of uh, collage more in, in the sense of uh, Schwitters, uh, when I think of collage and when I use um, papers found from magazine or newspaper, yes, it's really not archival, but uh, I find sometimes it's interesting to use uh, pieces of photographs that suggest something, whether it's just pure space or it's actually it has some sort of literary connection. I didn't include a lot of those kinds of images in the presentation, but um, uh, that is a part of uh, you know, some of the work that I've done. Okay. Thank you, Monica. Um, Dina. Yes. Um, all of you, I think, have used some kind of word like improvisation or interpretation in your uh, description of your work and of your process. So, and all of you are painters. So I'm wondering if you could, um, each, all, or any of you, talk about how um, the collage affects your painting. I know how you talked, you, you did talk a little bit how painting affects collage, but it's the idea of um, the hard edges, the interrupting of spaces, the um, unexpected that jump out at me with, your, with all of your collages and the freeing um, possibilities. As do any of you jump to collage to free up a painting? Do any or, or vice versa? Um, also, many of you have very painterly strokes, brush strokes in your paintings, and really nice, real, really hard edges in your collages. How do you make that trend? What's the relationship between the two? Anybody want to start? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, I, I think that I am uh, guilty of, um, I'm not guilty, but uh, in my paintings, um, yeah, brush strokes count. Uh, they are more painterly. They are, uh, they do have a different feeling. I don't paint hard edges um, and I don't paint flat shapes. And yet, when I work in collage, often that's exactly what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not so much, in my case, that I intend to abandon the painterly qualities, um, although I do end up abandoning them um, for the most part, but it's that, um, working with pieces of paper and being able to move them around on a larger surface uh, for me is freeing in terms of enabling me to focus on how I'm composing. Whereas when I'm working, when I'm painting, I'm generally working from observation and I'm searching in a different way. I'm searching for perception. I'm searching to make a mark that records perception. And um, I'm not doing that in the collages. Um, so for me, it's freeing in that way. Um, is something lost? Yeah, maybe so, um, but it's a different focus. And I guess I would say that I'm not so interested, or at least so far I have not been so interested in painting geometric hard edges, even though I admire many people who do that. Who, who else would like to speak about that? I, I can say that I, uh, I started out doing collage because I was frustrated with my paintings and I felt I was overworking them and the color wasn't uh, 
clear enough. And uh, I wanted something that was gonna be more decisive and, and you know, definite uh, in terms of forms. And so I'd say that I'm, that I'm still trying to catch up with my painting. You know, I've worked with collage all along uh, and I think it's, uh, I'm trying to learn from that in my paintings and trying to make my paintings now I don't know, I get frustrated with my paintings. You know, I'm scared to put in things like a, a, an abstract square in one of my paintings. You know, why would I do that? Uh, it comes from looking at things too much. I think working observationally can get you into this, uh, this thing that uh, Richard David Korn used to call the headlong, which is like you keep adding this and adding that. And oh yeah, there's a thing over there. And then there's a thing over there and you keep adding them and adding them. You don't step back and look at the painting and say, what does it really need? Did that really help to put all that in? And so, um, so I think uh, my uh, collage is trying to, uh, you know, act as a counterweight to that sort of tendency, I guess. I, I, I sort of see, uh, in my practice, I see both in, uh, well, I, I, I do draw quite a bit from life, but I don't actually, uh, it's something that just feeds my, um, uh, what I feel is my knowledge of the, the, uh, the visual world, but um, at this point, I think uh, my collage and uh, imagery uh, tends to be more flat because uh, I don't know whether it's because of my practice uh, in collage and, and sort of exploring pure shape and color. Uh, but um, yeah, I think there's probably more of a connection just visually with the abstract and the, the more, rep, more representational or subject matter uh, imagery that I, that I do. So, uh, but in terms of uh, working in collage, how it helps me uh, in, in my painting, um, I think it helps me to uh, kind of understand the rhythms that exist in, in nature just coming and also coming from within the what's within and what's without the making those kind of connections um, uh, in terms of rhythm and the sense the rhythms that exist in the sensations of color in, in, the, in the sensation of line and shape uh, exist in the world but also exist in us internally so um, I, I see them as very fluid from painting to collage Um, I, oh, am I muted? No, okay. Um, I think that what you just said, Monica, I can, I can relate to quite a lot. Um, for me, uh, collage is somehow less cerebral than painting. Um, painting, I tend to step back a lot and look and you know, just sit in my chair and just look at it, try to figure out what it needs. I think that what Hearn said about being decisive, I think in collage, it's, it's much easier for me to be more decisive with collage. Somehow it's not so precious or something. Um, and oftentimes, I, I really do think about rhythm a lot in, in collage, but also as I said before, color. And it's just so much about pure color quite often when I'm making collage. So is painting, but painting is just, um, painting is different for me. And, you know, I, after almost four years of not painting really because I, of the back surgery, I started again about a year ago. And I noticed at the time that my painting was taking on a, um, I was having a hard time deciding which way to go with my painting, whether to go the way I had gone, you know, when I, when I had to give up painting for a while, um, or to somehow allow, directly allow the collages uh, to be more of an influence. And in some cases, the collages were really a direct influence but I'm still trying to sort that out. I, I made a, de a decision though in those paintings to um, directly work from the collages. So it's kind of, you know, a work in progress. And now I'm not really painting much because I'm without a studio. So, um, you know, 
it's hard for me to, to sort of answer where my painting is going and how it's, you know, the, the influence of collage is, you know, going to take shape or not. I, I was just going to say that it seems like uh, over the last 10 years anyway, collage has become more and more a part of, you know, um, sort of the mainstay or focus in the studio. So it's a little bit to be determined how, my, how it's going to affect my painting uh, here a few, maybe down the road. Um, but in, in terms of improvisation, I, it's, it's nice to be working and working and you cut out a specific shape for a specific area and then you hold it up and it does work or it doesn't work. And if it doesn't, you throw it back into a pile and then you keep making and you've got all these random pieces and, and it's, it's fun. It's so nice to be able to take those and utilize them in other areas and activate the collage in such a fresh and unique way that you hadn't uh, you know, even considered before. I was just going to say for the body work I showed, the first one was an oil painting and the rest were collages, either graphite collages or um, uh, using uh, found objects, that sort of thing. Other questions? Oh, Lynette, please. And I just want to say Lynette has some gorgeous pieces in the artsy uh, Bowery collage show. So do look at Lynette's work online. Uh, Lynette, you're muted. Thank you, Naomi. That's very generous of you. Um, I have a question for everyone about the edge and the, the rectangle. And I wondered um, if when you're making collage, if sometimes the, the form of a color the edge of a color is something that breaks the rectangle. Or most of you seem to work within the rectangle or, and maybe you'll practice as you're making it, it might go beyond the edge of the rectangle, right? And come back in again. But it, everyone except Mark, Mark, you seem to break the edge and you let the edge of the collage find, you let the collage find its own edge. And so I was just wondering about what the rectangle means with such an improvisational practice and or process and um, yeah, how, how it fits into the rectangle or breaks the rectangle. Well, I was just oh, gonna yeah. say, oh, go ahead. Oh, let me just go real quick. I was just gonna say, I love rectangles <laughs> and I love the rectangular shape, but <laughs> I also, uh, so lately I, you know, it's been kind of going on for a while. I don't really think about it that much anymore. So sometimes they're more rectangular and sometimes they're more organic. And, uh, but a lot of the uh, sort of regular shipped ones are starting to feel really natural to me and, uh, and do just literally come from through the process of working. And so I love discovering them. And sometimes they're, they'll take on unique shapes. And if it seems to work, I, I enjoy allowing that to happen or allowing that to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I uh, I um, don't know if you noticed, but there was a there were a series of uh, collages that I had that did not um, end at the rectangle. <laughs> uh, they were uh, just the the shapes were placed in a more in a sort of rectangular space, but they did not end at an edge. And I, I have to say that I've done many collages where they're not. Um, restricted by the rectangle. Mm. So I, I think um, uh, mm. collage and cutout give you the freedom to mm. work in both those kind of, uh, with both those kind of uh, ends at, at, uh, right. at right. work. Yeah. Um, I, t that's, that's one rule that I tend to keep almost like I have to have, for some reason, I have to have a rule. <laughs> I don't know. And then I question it, but usually I stay within the rectangle. And it's a, a little bit of torture for me sometimes when um, a color shape extends beyond the edge of the rectangle and I, and I happen to like it better than if I cut it off. And I don't know what to do. I, I get very baffled by that. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I tend to stay with that as a rule. And maybe I should just let go of that as a rule. I, I think it goes back to uh, probably my days at the New York Studio School. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all have that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I, I don't know. But, you know, what is that all about? And, you know, is it time to let go of it? I don't know. I can't, I'm really, I really admire you, Mark, for allowing yourself to just do go against that. But I think what happens is when you let a shape or color exceed a, a parameter, uh, it, it gives a kind of energy to that to that shape. So um, th there is a there is a good reason to do that at times because it's necessary, you know, to have something push out of the rectangle. And I, I saw, see that very much with your work that you have on, on yeah. in the show yeah. online, that there is a kind of energy that's created when you depart from that norm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that the force field opens up for yes, me. Yes, exactly, yes. Um, and that's but there's a, tension. there's a tension with the rectangle, isn't there? There's a real taut tension when you stay within the rectangle. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I to think about and, the and there, there's the, there's a kind of an implication of trying to um, extend out beyond the edges while it's within the rectangle. Right. That's part of the tension, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, the dimension of space. Yeah. Yes, it's very much a matter of you know does space does the space end? Uh, you know, it gets back to that idea of time. You know, is this a continuum or is this mm -hmm. just defined? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just uh, static in a sense, mm -hmm. not necessarily static as right. an image, but static in, in time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, Lynette, Thank I'm you. thinking it's really about- Really wonderful presentation, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Naomi, there's a question from Greer who asked, um, I wonder if you like Frank Lobdell's work. Okay, if I like, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Oh, if you like Frank Lobdell's work, L-O-B-D-E-L-L-S. <clears throat> okay, well, now I will have to confess my ignorance because I'm not familiar with it. Okay. So Greer, I will um, have something to, to look at and I will get back to you on that. Um, thank you. You're welcome. He's a Bay Area painter, um, New Devon Corn, and uh, Oh, Hearn, you probably know about Frank Lobdell. Yeah, I know. I'm not uh, particularly, uh, you know, I've never been that engaged with his work, but I know his work, yeah. Abstract paintings. Well. Oh, here's a question from Audrey. Audrey asks, is edge discussion limited to collage? Um, I don't. I don't see why it, it should be really. I mean, when you think of someone like Elizabeth Murray, for example, who I happen to really like, um, I don't. I, I, I just noticed there's a big Robert Mangold show who just uh, just opened, and uh, he uses all kinds of variations on the frame. It's about the frame, kind of uh, is a very important thing. For me, I think about um, Cezanne, especially the late watercolors, um, where the brush marks go to where they need to go to. And he doesn't push to the edge of the paper if he doesn't feel he needs to. Um, Mark's work feels like it's doing that same thing to me. Um, for myself with collage, I guess... I am thinking about the edge being part of the composition. And so that is a kind of a rule. And I haven't worked with what happens if you exceed the edge. Um, what does that mean? Does it, I would think it, it enables, well in Lynette's work for example, and in Mark's work, um, you can have movement that becomes more forceful in that way. 
Um, what is, is it a trade-off? Is there something that you give up in order to have the freedom to push a shape or a color as far as it wants to go? And it's a good question. I don't have an answer to it, but it's something I will, I would like to think more about. Would you like me to read some of the comments? They're not questions, they're comments. I, I'm gonna say, um, are, these are comments that were directed um, to you privately, Tricia? Oh, some of them are to everyone. So let's say that the ones that are to everyone, people can read if they are interested. If there are some that were to you that, um, that feel important to share, and after the Zoom meeting goes off, I think the, the, the questions or comments disappear, right? You can't go back and look at them on chat or, or what? I'm not sure. I think they might just a comment, Jared. Uh, um, do you have a way to save the chat? Well, well I could cut and paste chat? it. I can cut and paste it uh, to my computer. Yeah. Um, you, you can save the chat. Go to the chat room. How do you do that? Uh, I think there's three little dots. Yeah, you yeah, click on yeah. that, and there's a drop down menu, and it says save chat. You just have to remember to do it before ending the meeting. I don't, there's a drop down menu, but it doesn't say save chat. I think it depends what level of Zoom um, membership maybe, you have. Maybe her and can do that. I have save chat. Little three little dots are at the bottom. The bottom right. Oh, at the bottom? Okay. At the very bottom. Yeah, if you click on the three dots there, it'll be save chat as an option comes up. I see save chat. So so when when we stop the meeting before you ended, Hearn, just give me a minute and let me save the chat because there okay. keep being new comments. People are commenting like as they're leaving the meeting. Um, <laughs> If anyone has a burning question they'd like to ask, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Audrey? Uh, you have to unmute, Audrey. I have to unmute, yeah. Um, um, my, my question is um, just addressed to, does your choice of palette change when you're using a collage versus a painting or whatever other form of artwork you're making? I'm going to uh, answer that and other people can as well. For me, it changes dramatically uh, because when I'm painting, whether it's from observation or a study from the masters or whatever it is, I'm very perceptually oriented and I need as many colors as I need and as many gradations. Um, and so there's no limit to how many colors I'm going to use. Uh, whereas I'm very deliberately limiting my palette when I make collages. I'm choosing a palette and then I'm sticking to that palette. Um, well, sometimes I decide I need one more color, but I am, my way of composing in collage, one, I impose on myself uh, a kind of a rule, a methodology that is totally dependent on limiting the palette. And I would never think to do that in my paintings. So for me, it's very different. Anybody else want to talk to that? Um, yeah, Monica. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I kind of like to keep the range of color in both collage and painting pretty broad. So, um, so, it, so yeah, there, it's, it's, as I said before, it's a bit fluid. Um, you know, as I, I say, I like to, to go from the deepest, darkest range to the, the highest, brightest uh, hues. So, um, so there's, they can differ at, you know, uh, at the same, you know, my painting can be working in a different hue as my collage, but that doesn't mean that at another time it will coincide with the, the, the hues and the, and the values of the collage. So I like to keep the whole thing open. <laughs> oh, here's another question from Greer. He asks, do you think that collage is more relevant to the digital age? I 
Anybody I don't think want so. to tackle that? <laughs> I don't think so. I, Hands I, on. My instinct is to say it as I, I don't feel any relationship one way or another with collage and digitalization of our lives. As, uh, prob you know, I mean, I think we all, or most of us started doing it way before we had computers, right? I don't know. I, I don't see how. Well, I think collage uh, is certainly very easy to adapt into the digital world with Photoshop and everything. You can always be uh, collaging things now in a way that doesn't require material effort, mm -hmm. really. Um, I think I'm interested in kind of like questioning about how our attention changes, given that we're subjected to so much collage, just looking at, uh, at TV or anything, you know, you're getting all these uh, fast changing uh, edited images coming at you. And I, I get the feeling that, that we accommodate a lot more uh, disruption in our visual field than uh, we used to, you know, we've gotten used to that in a way. Uh, I don't know if that's, uh, that's not a good thing or a bad thing in itself, I guess, but. Um, I but one is not necessarily reflecting that uh, in one's work. I mean, it really, that you could, uh, one could, but that's not necessarily always happening in the collage. I mean, I've done, actually, I have done digital collage, but generally I do it, I start off with the papers that I'm actually um, working with uh, in a tactile way and then um, manipulating them in Photoshop but uh, it, it's more like a printing, uh, the, the idea of a print process rather than, uh, you know, the pure digital ether. I'm going to suggest that we leave it there. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. Um, thank you to our panel and our facilitators. And thank you to our most wonderful Bowery Gallery community of um, members and friends. Um, we really appreciate sharing this time with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. It was really lovely. Fantastic. <laughs>